Let's take our Bibles and <clears throat> read together from Hebrews chapter 3, verses 7 to 19. Hebrews 3, and we read from verse 7 through to the end of the chapter. <clears throat> <clears throat> Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness where your fathers put me to the test and saw my works for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked with that generation and said, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways. As I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter my rest. Take care, brothers, lest there be any in any of you an evil unbelieving heart, leading you to fall away from the living God. But exhort one another every day, as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. As it is said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. For who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not all those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not with those who sinned, whose bodies fell in the wilderness? And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? So we see that they were unable to enter because of unbelief. May the Lord add his blessing to this reading from his word for his own name's sake. Now, let's turn back together to that passage from Hebrews that we read, Hebrews 3, verses 7 through 19, as we continue our studies in the book of Hebrews together. It was the late Francis Schaeffer um, who, in his magnum opus, How Should We Then Live, uh, which is essentially the PhD thesis that he produced when he obtained his doctorate, uh, expanded and, and put into book form for general consumption by the Christian public. Um, and he really analyzes the, um, the decline and fall of Western civilization uh, since its, its high point um, in the, the time of the Reformation down to uh, what's increasingly becoming its low point in this age in which we live. Rather than by making progress, that was the aspiration um, of our forebearers, we find ourselves regressing, uh, not just morally um, and socially, but spiritually and intellectually. Um, that, there, that there is, despite the, the, the abundance of education that's available today, uh, there's actually a growing lack of appreciation um, of the privilege of what we have and making good use of what we have in the system. Um, but he, he, he charts the, the decline of Western civilization to the age in which we now live, and he describes it as the age of personal peace and Afri affluence. That what people aspire to is my own space with my own wealth. I want to be able to afford to enjoy myself without interference, um, not merely from neighbors and those around me, um, but even in some cases from family members within who are my own flesh and blood. We want to be left to enjoy life ourselves. But of course, tragically, if we are honest, uh, far from finding that golden age of, of rest and peace, we find the opposite. There is unrest. There is dissatisfaction. There is an aching void in every human heart that nothing seems to fill. But of course, there's nothing new under the sun. And we only need to go back to the fourth century, to the days of Augustine. And he famously said, Lord, we have no rest until we find our rest in you. You've made us for yourself. And it's only when you restore us to yourself that we discover where true peace and true happiness is to be found. 
I think it's easy for us to allow the, the language of salvation and redemption to become mere cliches, perhaps especially in this province in which we live, which has been so blessed for so many generations with gospel witness and gospel preaching, um, that, you, that we just lapse into the language, well, are you saved? Without us stopping to think for a moment, you know, that's a loaded statement. If you claim to be saved, that's the most radical statement that it's possible for any human being to make. Because if you say you're saved, you're no longer lost. If you say that you've been brought to faith in Jesus Christ, then you've been brought into newness of life and fullness of life in the Lord Jesus Christ. That it's more than just ticking the box and saying, well, I'm no longer damned and facing judgment, but I'm redeemed and looking forward to heaven. It means a whole radicalization of the life that we have and the way that we live, not just individually, but collectively together as a church in this place. Explains why the Bible speaks about deliverance and why it matters from a whole range of different angles and using a whole range of of different words and vocabulary. So, So here it's interesting that the writer who, again, as we've said before in this series of studies, is delving into the message of salvation, which the Hebrew believers thought they knew, but had actually lost a grip on. To say, no, let's go back to first principles and let's learn all over again what it means to enjoy the blessings of salvation that come through the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's interesting that the writer is homing in on the language of rest as he reaches out to those whose hope of salvation was beginning to waver. They were, they were becoming restless instead of enjoying the rest that God intended his people to enjoy. Instead of, if we could borrow the language of the Westminster Confession of Faith in chapter 11, instead of resting in Christ alone for their salvation, they were scrabbling left, right, and center for other things to make it seem better. Scrambling back to Old Testament rituals and practices, thinking that what was meant to be a picture of the salvation that was to come was better than the reality of the salvation that Christ ushered in. And it's fascinating to to note that the approach that the author takes as he seeks to help these struggling believers was like like an exercise in spiritual mathematics. I was never great at maths in school. Um, It wasn't my best subject. Um, but, But I was always intrigued by people who were good mathematicians, and the, the, the mathematical gymnastics that they could do just with mental arithmetic, and without even getting a bit of paper and a pen out to, to do the, the sums visibly. Of course, we've lost all these skills today because of um, handheld calculators. Um, and, 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 but, but to see how the human brain is capable of, of this um, and, and, and to work it through with, with logic, theological logic, is significant. He, he, he walks them through the issues that they were facing line by line, but does so in light of God's word. So in each of the sections that we've covered so far, that there's five sections that have uh, unfolded in this passage or, or in, the, in, the, in the book of Hebrews. Um, each of them is punctuated by the word therefore. These things are true in terms of God and his salvation. Therefore, These things should be put into practice by you as his professing people. You've got the ability in Christ to do what you could never have done outside of Christ when you were still in your sins. And it comes out in this quote in this passage from Psalm 95 in verse 11 where it says, As I swore in my wrath, they shall not um, enter his rest um, Sorry, backing up to verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says, Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion on the day of testing in the wilderness, where your fathers put me to the test and saw my work for 40 years. Therefore, I was provoked by that generation and said, they, they always go astray in their heart. They have not known my ways as I swore in my wrath. Therefore, they shall not enter my, re- my rest. Now, why does he reach for that? Because these... Um, 
Jewish people living in the New Testament era and who'd been exposed to the beginnings of New Testament preaching of the fulfillment of God's promise of salvation through Christ were harking back to the days of old, the pre-Christ days when it was but a promise and a prophecy. But he said, look at your, your forefathers and look at the way in which they experienced the greatest deliverance of Old Testament times, which was the exodus from Egypt, the, the, the journey through the Red Sea, the um, provision in the wilderness, and the journey through the wilderness. Yes, it took 40 years. It's interesting how the figure 40 crops up again and again in the Old Testament with having redemptive significance. Um, so so the, the wilderness journey... Um, was a great paradigm or picture of the great redemption that God would eventually usher in in a far more wonderful way by sending his own son to lead us to salvation. And, and it's, um, he, he speaks about entering into God's rest. That's what the promised land was intended to be. And that idea of rest in its deepest sense would have resonated with his readers and, and the same is true in our own day and age. Um, you know, how many of us, uh, we, we get to the end of the working week and we're just exhausted. We get to the end of the working day and we get home and we, we just collapse into a chair and we vegetate for the rest of the night uh, because we're just worn out. And, and that's the, the, not just the, the product of this, this age in which we live, it's been true throughout the ages. So we would do well to rediscover as Christians what the rest in redemption is like and how it blessed us um, as, his people, as God's people. From, from the very outset in creation, um, it, the, the day of rest was meant to be the epitome of life at its very best. God crowned his creative activity by taking the seventh day and setting it apart as being the best day. On this day, you shall, you shall rest. The other days of the week, you shall, you shall work the soil, you shall cultivate the garden, you shall use your energies um, in, in maximizing the potential of this gift that God has given to you. But then come apart and rest with me a, a while. Resting not in isolation, but in communion with God himself. And in that sense, we will... Discover afresh what Augustine was saying. Lord, we have no rest until we find our rest in you. How does that work itself out in practice? Well, it, it, it comes first of all in terms of how we respond to God's word, verses 7 to 12. How we respond to God's word. The section begins with this quotation from Psalm 95, but, but note how it's introduced by, uh, by the words in, in verse 7. Therefore, as the Holy Spirit says... He doesn't say, as it says in the book of Psalms. No, he says, therefore, as the Holy Spirit says. Every time we open our Bibles, whether it be Old Testament or New Testament, it is the Holy Spirit who is speaking to us through the written word that God has given. Two things stand out in that statement. First is the fact that the, the, the Spirit is speaking in the word in a once-for-all sense. Um, 1 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is, given, is God breathed. And, and don't forget that, that the language of the breath of God is synonymous with the spirit of God. Um, and and the, the breathed out word of God, the once for all scriptures of the Old Testament and the New Testament are the gift of God by his spirit to the world and in particular to the church to whom he has entrusted the stewardship of the scriptures. So there's a once for all truthfulness, reliability, inerrancy that is bound up with this book. It's not like any other book that the world has ever seen. But there's, a, there's a, a, another dimension to it. There's a once for allness about it, but as Herman Bavinck says in his systematic theology, it's also the God-breathing word it continues in the hands of the Holy Spirit to be alive as we hear and to animate our souls as we receive that word. You know, it's, it's striking, isn't it, that there, there, um, 
There are special times whenever you sit under a particular sermon and, and it just, it, it affects you deeply. It stirs you inwardly and, and, and it may even impact you physically. I've been in, in um, gatherings where the word has been preached and, and there's just a, a de- deathly silence descends upon the congregation in recognition that we have, we, have, we have been in the presence of something extraordinary happening as the word of God has been faithfully opened up but in a way that penetrates our innermost thoughts and innermost desires of our heart. It's once for all, but it's always fresh and always penetrating. It's borne out by three horizons, three levels. It points back to God speaking through Moses in this passage, to the time when it was written, but it also speaks to the present. But it also carries this potent warning um, in the fact that the, the wilderness generation heard the voice of God in extraordinary ways, literally at the foot of Mount Sinai. They, they heard the voice of God speaking to Moses at the top of Sinai, but the mountain shook and the people trembled, realizing this is the voice of God himself. But they chose to ignore what God said. And there's every reason to believe that if they had listened to what God had said, at that point, at Sinai, the journey between there and the promised land that geographically wasn't very far would not have taken 40 years to complete. It was because they hardened their heart and refused to accept God's word that God says, right, you're going to be stuck in wilderness mode for the next four decades. And none of you who have traveled through the, de- the, the desert, apart from a select few, will actually enter the land that I've promised to your descendants. This was God's righteous anger. Wrath is not God losing his temper. This is God settled, calm, and consistently administered discipline when he shows his wrath against sinners who will ultimately face the most awful end if they've never repented. But to us as children who should know better, he will discipline us for a season in order that we might be restored in the long term. That's why God says, you saw my work for 40 years. You you had the opportunity to see up close and, and personal my wonderful works of redemption, provision of Passover when you were hungry. Saw how you crossed the Red Sea as you began the journey waters being parted. You saw it at Sinai. You saw it in the remainder of your journey when I brought you through troubles against enemies. I kept you safe and I brought you not just to the borders of the promised land, but ultimately into it. It's not hard to see how that relates to the Hebrews and to their situation. It resonates because, A, because it was their history. These are our people but also because they realized you were doing exactly what our, our forebears did. We are beginning to harden our hearts. We're beginning to close our ears to what God is saying. And most of all, we fail to appreciate in all its fullness the wonder of what God has provided through his son. That raises for us the question, how are we guided in the way that we respond, not just to the challenges and crises of life, but to life itself. What, what gives us our bearings every day? What keeps us going week after week, month after month, year after year? If it isn't God, and what God has provided for us in his wonderful salvation through his son, then we will flounder. That's why God allows testing to come to us. Not to crush us or to undermine our faith, but to actually prove that even in the worst of times, I'm with you. And even in the most challenging experiences, the everlasting arms of love are round about and underneath you. You see, if we have God's word and we know what it is, how we respond to that word will shape how we cope with what comes our way. And that's true. That's a lesson that we need to learn when we are young, where we're setting out on life, because it's something that will be tested again and again 
through the whole course of our life to the very end. But also it, it, it says something about how we relate not just to God, but also to God's people. And that comes out in verses 12 to 15. The, the writer immediately spells out the relevance of, of this quotation for the, he, for the Hebrews and, and what they face. And, and he says in, in verse 12, Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. And I think the language of falling away there um, is best uh, understood either as having um, a false profession of faith, claiming to be a Christian, but not really being a Christian, or else um, of, of those who, who genuinely are Christians, failing to appreciate what we have, and therefore failing to experience the blessing that God has said he will give us. And appreciating that even in difficult times, challenging times, faith-testing times, God will always bless in the most surprising ways, in the way that he leads us, provides for us, and keeps us. By the way, the antidote to this danger is a shared responsibility. Look at verses 12 to 14. Take care, brothers, lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God, but exhort one another every day as long as it is called today, that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have, we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. You know, you know they you know, one of the, the most um, insidious expressions to creep into the Christian vocabulary, and, it, and it's tended to be more uh, a, a recent phenomenon, 20th, 21st century, where Christians talk about me and my personal saviour. Which is something that is true in one sense, in that salvation is a personal thing that we enjoy, but ultimately it's a collective thing. It's a shared thing, because to be born again is to be born into a new family. We're taken out of the fallen, spiritually dead family of Adam, and we are born into the family of the children of God, made alive by the Spirit of God through our union with the Christ of God. So to be bound to Christ in saving union means that we are simultaneously bound to one another in the bond of fellowship. That there is a spiritual chemistry that unites us because we have the same spiritual genetic composition. And, and that's, that's striking. And it's challenging. Um, because, because it means that um, we, we have the same... Uh, the same Christ is shared by us all, and therefore in Christ we are equipped to function as a family. You know, it, it's, I think it's true in every congregation. There are some people that we relate to easily, and there's some people that we don't relate to easily, and there's people in the middle. But because we are blood-bought brothers and sisters in Christ, we do not have the luxury of saying, well, I relate to him, but not to her any more than in your natural family, there may be one particular child who's um, a difficult piece of work to handle. You don't say, well, he or she, you, know, you, you can just you know, go and eat somewhere else. You don't sit around the table with us. No, they're part of the family. So you, you include them and you work hard at including them and building those kind of relationships that are worthy of the family to which we belong and the Christ who is its savior. We do not allow the deceitfulness of sin to disrupt the fellowship of the family. And one of the numerous one and other passages in the New Testament that serves to remind us is, uh, of this is the fact that um, together in Christ we, um, we, we, we share something that this world cannot give. Something that comes from heaven. And, and Paul makes much of this in, in nearly all of his, his epistles. 
Uh, and that's something that we need to rediscover in this, this age in which, which is defined by individualism. What I want, what I prefer. That really we need to be looking out for one another and serving one another. Doing what is pleasing to them rather than what is pleasing to me. So for these Hebrew Christians facing major crisis from within, those who were strong in faith should be stepping up to the plate to helping those who were weak in the faith. There's a double edge to this shared vigilance because he, he, he warns uh, against the the, the, the danger of personal failure. We can be so conscious of the failures in others around us that we fail to see the failures in our own lives. Somebody once said quite wisely that if you point the finger at somebody, don't forget there's three fingers pointing back at yourself. That before we criticize a brother or sister in the faith, let's recognize that we are in need of constructive criticism as well if we are to grow and mature. So in the language of, of uh, Cain in response to God, when he says, where's your brother Abel? After he just murdered his brother. What was his response? Am I my brother's keeper? keeper? And the unspoken answer to that is, yes, you are Abel or Cain. Yeah. <laughs> and whenever God says to, to us, are you your brother's or your sister's keeper? The answer is we are, every one of us. We should be looking out for one another. We should be praying for one another. We should be ministering to one another as part of what it means to function as a family. But it also speaks about how we should rely specifically on God's Son in verse 14. All that the writer says about um, corporate and personal responsibility would be useful, useless if it wasn't for this one vital detail. Look at verse 14 again, uh, where it says, For we have, we have come to share in Christ, if indeed we hold our original confidence firm to the end. That what we have in common, what we share is ultimately and supremely the Lord Jesus Christ. To have him is to have everything. He is our all in all. He is the one who Paul describes as the one in whom all things consist. The universe literally holds together because of Christ, its maker and sustainer. But in a particular sense, in the new creation, we, God's people, hold together, not because of our own personal holiness, but because of the perfection of Christ as the one to whom we have been united, the one in whom we live and move and have our being, the one in whom we are enabled to live to God's glory and to each other's good. It's a vital and a living union that through new birth by the Spirit of God, we have been joined to him in our salvation. In other words, it isn't just calling on these believers to try a little bit harder, but to avail themselves of what is already theirs in Christ. I used the illustration before of, of computers. I came to the game late, and I'm still learning, um, but, but it, it never ceased to amaze me. At times, never, um, Derek Thomas, who, uh, who brought me into the world of computing, um, I'd say, Derek, I'm just lost with this thing. I don't know what to do. He said, not a problem. Bring it around to my house. I'll sort you out. And even more recently, the, the time that we were, lived for a year in, in Donna Cadi, uh, and again, struggling with computing and, and getting a computer to work properly. I had a personal consultant in the person of Richard Beatty. I just had to ring him up. Probably got tired of hearing me saying I've got, I'm in trouble. But he never failed to come around. He said, not a problem. Ten seconds. Fingers flew over the keyboard. The thing was working again. <laughs> you know, and, and, and here it is, that, that we are able to, to come into a whole new experience of life as we avail ourselves of what's already in there. But we just didn't know how to tap into it and see its benefits. That's why he speaks of unbelief and rebellion amongst the Israelites. They, they had witnessed the most extraordinary display of divine power. Pharaoh's army destroyed, 
Red Sea parted, a whole new life opening up for them as they headed off towards the promised land. That their unbelief and their rebellion had no basis. But for New Testament Christians, it goes to an altogether new level. Because we've seen a different kind of exodus embodied in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's exactly the language that he uses as he faces the cross in Luke 19. My exodus is looming. It's not just a private and personal thing, but I will bring my people through what I've achieved into a whole new world. We can't stress enough that salvation is in Christ alone and experienced through our union with him. Um, as, uh, as someone has put it, Jesus plus anything equals nothing. As soon as we try to add anything to Jesus to experience salvation as God intended it, we've actually subtracted from what God has given to us. But as well as that, we need to appreciate that he has put us in families for a reason. The family of God. Different backgrounds, circumstances, needs. But he's made us one in Christ. We feel for one another as part of the same body. Pray for one another lovingly and faithfully. Minister to one another as God enables us. And since we've been given all that we need... We've got the responsibility to use it to God's glory. Mm -hmm. Lastly, very quickly, how we learn from God's warnings, 16 to the end. For those who were, for those who were, for who were those who heard and yet rebelled? Was it not those who left Egypt led by Moses? And with whom was he provoked for 40 years? Was it not those who had sinned and whose bodies fell in the wilderness? You know, ours is the generation that's been brought up in the notion that negatives are not good. Um, I, I remember that point in life where I discovered that um, teachers in schools no longer used red ink to mark your homework or your examinations. I remember asking one particular teacher, why are you not using red ink anymore? Uh, because it upsets people. Uh, red is a provocative color and it, and it makes them feel uncomfortable. So if you use a blue ink or a black pen, then, then that's much more soothing if you have to, regardless of what mark you're going to get. Um, and and you know, we're, we're in a, a day and age whenever people um, aren't failed. Perhaps you say to them, well, you haven't done quite as well as the others, but you haven't failed. Failure is a dirty word. Well, brothers and sisters, we do fail. We fail miserably. Every time we look in the mirror, we see failure looking back at us. Um, and, and, and it's... It's good to face our failure because until we've faced up to our failures, we don't find our forgiveness and our restoration. So this paragraph that rounds off the section gives us three examples of how Israel didn't simply fail, but they had rebelled in the wilderness. And notice how they, it is introduced in verse 16. They heard the words of God, and yet they rebelled. They heard the actual voice of, of God speaking. It, it rumbled down the mountain as he was speaking to Moses, and they trembled at the sound of God's voice audibly being heard. These people didn't stumble in the dark. They deliberately sinned against the light. And it is more culpable to sin against the light than to sin in ignorance. That if we have been taught the scriptures, if we know what God is teaching in the word of God, and we willfully go against what God has commanded, then we are, we are, guilty, more, we are, we are guiltier by factors. Because we know full well what God has done and what God has given us through the Lord Jesus Christ. All of which sent a loud message to the people of Israel in Moses' day as they saw what God was not only doing through Moses but what God was saying through Moses. God was saying, trust me. I haven't failed you yet and I won't fail you until I... I, I won't fail you ever. I'll bring you safely home.
But they persisted in questioning God and grumbling against Moses. And the outcome was stark. As he says in verse 18, And to whom did he swear that they would not enter his rest, but to those who were disobedient? We see that they were unable to enter because of their unbelief. These were people who had seen the mighty works of God. These are those who heard the voice of God. These are those who have been delivered by God, and yet they hardened their hearts against what God was saying through his servant Moses. God issues these warnings not to crush us, but actually to save us from our own folly and our own foolish choices. God tells us, I've got a track record that is flawless in terms of my dealing with my people. I've proved it in the ultimate possible way by not sparing my own son, but giving him up for you all for your salvation. I can do no more than what I have done. So you've got no reason to doubt that the good work I've begun in you, I will carry through to completion when the Lord Jesus Christ appears. And then we shall enter into the fullness of rest, but even in the ups and downs of the journey in between, we will know a peace of God that passes all understanding, that keeps us heart and mind in the knowledge and love of Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray you'll forgive us for the times that we doubt you. We pray, Lord, that you will forgive us for the times that we fail to make, take full advantage of everything that you've given us in your word, by your spirit, and through your son, and as a fellowship with your people. And we pray, O oh Lord, that week on week, month on month, year on year, we would continue to make progress in the faith and in our Christian service until we hear those words come home and the words of welcome, well done, good and faithful servant, enter into the rest that I've prepared for you. For Jesus' sake, amen. amen.